Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Microsoft Research Technology that is kind of more high impact, um, starting with a talk on, on Kinect. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Andrew Fitzgibbon, who is uh, a principal researcher in the machine um, learning group here in the Cambridge lab. And he will tell us more about the kind of research involvement in this uh, Microsoft product. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Um, Right, who has used the Connect? Okay, about half maybe, good. Um, that's good. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about how we at Microsoft Cambridge helped to make the Connect system work. Um, Connect is a lot of things. It's hardware, audio, audio and video hardware, uh, various different parts of software. And I'll tell you about the bit that we did, but just do remember as I talk that you know about a thousand people were involved in making Connect come to market, and I'm going to be talking about the work of about six of us. Um, so before I start, I know Ken has already told you a bit about MSR Cambridge. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the computer vision group at MSR Cambridge and, and our sort of philosophy, how we worked and uh, projects we've worked on. Um, the Ken will have told you about the Microsoft, the MSR. Uh, mission statement, a different way I have of stating the MSR mission statement is what are our outputs? What does Microsoft Research produce? Um, you know, what do we get good marks for at the end of the year? One type of output is uh, academic papers, as you know, or as you will know, and the, uh, often with each paper there's a patent uh, on some piece of technology that we think is worth patenting. And then the other kind of outputs are what we call technology transfers. Um, very obvious ones, I'll talk about um, something we pushed into Microsoft Office, which is an interesting story about how Blue Sky's research goes into product. Um, you'll hear later about F-sharp. Does everyone know about F-sharp? Wow, nobody heard of F-sharp. I don't think that's true. Uh, very good, excellent, yeah. Um, there's stuff you may have heard of the SenseCam project, a wearable camera, where Microsoft did not know how to um, do anything with the SenseCam, so we licensed it to a third party. So we licensed the technology and other people developed the product. And of course, the final mode of interaction is that people in product groups, for example, Bing or Xbox, uh, ring us up and say, we have a problem, we'd like you to solve it. And that was, that's what happened in the Connect um, case. So to look a little bit at the computer vision group and how it interacts like this, um, here's a paper that um, uh, three people in our group published in SIGGRAPH 2004. And it says, if you have an image and you would like to pick out the foreground objects, we can give you a very simple uh, technology involving um, dragging a rectangle, and it will pick out the image. And if any of you have access to this version of PowerPoint, um, you will probably know that you can click on an image like this, click Remove Background. It makes a sort of a rough initial guess as to what you want to remove. And you can do a few mouse clicks. And it has picked out the object. So in a sense, this is a sort of six years from academic paper to appearing in product. Um, but this is, a, <clears throat> this is one, of the, um, one of the ways in which we really hoped we would uh, help Microsoft um, you know, when we first invented or looked at the graph cut res research. It should be an incredibly simple thing that people um, use every day and just don't even worry about. OK, so that's um, one piece of research from paper to incorporation in Microsoft product. Other pieces of research that are blue skies, we don't know if there's any use for them yet. This is some work we did a couple of years ago where we take a chap's face and uh, we can stick mustaches, eyebrows, and um, uh, makeup on him. Um, and you might say, what is the use of this? And you know, um, we don't think this is really an everyday video editing task that people want to do. What's the real use of this? We're investigating models for three-dimensional representations of objects which change their shape as you look at them. 
Um, Connect is one way of solving this problem where you have a depth camera, but we were looking at ways of solving this camera problem where you only have a, a 2D camera. Oh, it stopped. Just a minute. So, um, our goal was to perform a three dimensional reconstruction of this video in order that we could add these 3D objects. So, for example, when the guy's face covers the mustache, it's correctly occluded. So you need to explicitly model the occlusion relationships. And you would think that you need a three-dimensional model of the scene to do this. Um, the Blue Skies research here was to ask the question, well, um, do we really want a three-dimensional model? A mathematical surface is a mapping from R2 to R3. The surface lives in 2D. So what we really want is a 2D reconstruction, and this clearly isn't going to do it of this face, so we could put mustaches on. We have no idea yet what that's going to be useful for, but we think it's, um, it's interesting to explore. Um, another area that we thought was interesting to explore was to see if we could uh, take um, images, like this image here, and label every pixel in the image with the category of object that is represented under that pixel. Um, so, um, for example, the labeling for this image would be building for this area up here, road down here, and car in here. And why, are we do, why did we do that? We started this work in collaboration um, with Cambridge University, um, let's say about five years ago. Why did we do it? Because no one knew how to do it. Um, it was a problem that looked like it might be soluble with some technologies we had, um, but basically we had no idea what it was useful for. Uh, it wasn't because Microsoft was entering the agriculture business. Um, you know, it was purely a blue, sky, blue skies problem. That work today um, has been adapted to a medical imaging uh, scenario where um, as more and more of us begin to consume our own medical imagery, so as we begin to own our own MRI scans, we want to navigate them to understand what goes on in medical imagery. Um, more and more naive users will be interpreting CT and MRR scans, so what we would like is a way where we could automatically label different components of the MR scan, so we could say, uh, this is um, bone or whatever. Um, you know, conventional methods of doing this give you a result which is pretty ropey. Our entangled decision product, uh, forests give you a better result. This is what we would like. One day we will get there. What's interesting about this from the point of view of our group is the entangled decision product decision forest is actually a really, I believe, because I didn't do the work so I'm allowed to say this, I think it's a really interesting, clever development of a very old technology in decision trees. It's a general machine learning um, advance. It just happened that because um, uh, Antonio Criminisi and his group were looking at a medical task, that was where they applied it. But there's very much, because we have a general machine learning group, there's very much a contribution um, up into both computer vision and machine learning from the medical vision group. Okay, so today I'm going to talk essentially about this paper, which uh, some of you may have heard of. Uh, this is the paper published at CVPR, uh, the Computer Vision Pattern Recognition Conference, uh, just about a week ago, which essentially describes how Kinect works. Um, and the authors are uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge, Microsoft Research Cambridge, 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 and then Mark Finocchio, Richard Moore, and Alex Kipman, who are people in Xbox. Um, who, um, who did the work, and Andrew Blake again from Microsoft Research Cambridge. So this is a collaboration between the Xbox team and us in making Collect work, and I'm going to show you, you know, what that collaboration involved. That collaboration began um, with this email. Um, so Mark Finocchio, who you remember from the paper, emailed Jamie and um, asked Jamie about work he'd done in his, with his, in his PhD thesis uh, in Cambridge Engineering Department, and um, you know, he's not giving much away because it's an incredibly top secret project at this point. Um, and I must say that in Microsoft Research we occasionally get emails like this and uh, quite a lot of them say important scenario and sometimes they're not as important, maybe it doesn't feel as important as they really are. Um, as you now know, this important scenario was, you know, a billion dollars worth of expenditure or whatever it is. Um, so, um, or eight million con units sold or whatever the number is. Um, so, you know, it turned out to be pretty exciting, but it just started with this, uh, this sort of uh, email out of the blue. So they told us what we wanted to do, and just to, in case you don't know what's going on, 
they told us we would like to have a camera point at a person in a room, and then we'd like to have a 3D skeleton um, tracking um, of that person in the room. We, as academics, knew what the academic state of the art was. Um, so we, we tried a bunch of things. We immediately said, are you sure you really want the skeleton? Surely you just want to be able to detect punch, kick, etc." And they said, no, we want the skeleton because the skeleton makes it very easy to explain to games developers what this system does. You stand in front of it and it produces the position of your body joints. It's a very clean interface to the camera. So we knew what the academic state of the art was. Um, and you'll find this talk is, of course, massively Cambridge biased. Um, so uh, Toshiba Lab in Cambridge in 2008 had a system where uh, this chap could stand in front of a camera with a blue screen behind him and then a 3D rendering of, um, a, of a model following his pose could be superimposed on the video. So we knew that in real time you could do this sort of work where you would um, uh, emulate the pose of the video a little bit jerky and with some difficulties that I'll tell you about later. Uh, we also knew work that I had done um, with the Cambridge Engineering Lab that, so this system was fast, but it, had a, it could cope with only a small range of poses, and I'll, carry, I'll quantify that later. Um, um, with Roberto here and uh, Ram Navaratnam, um, we built a system which could cope with a wide range of poses, so given this input image, a 2D image, um, we can output a 3D representation of what's happening, um, and this video is sped up about 100 times. So we had a system that could deal with a reasonably wide range of poses, um, but was extremely slow, maybe at the order of a minute per frame, and we needed to be, we needed to be a, well faster than real time. Um, so this is good. We knew what the academic state of the art was. So we said to the Xbox people, or at least I said, um, other people were more positive, I said, this is good, this is why you have a research lab, because we can tell you that it's not possible, and we can save you lots of, uh, lots of research money. Um, but sadly, they, they wouldn't listen to us. Um, they, they insisted that it was possible. One reason they insisted that it was possible <coughs> that we didn't realize at the beginning was that they had a camera which, instead of producing RGB values, um, produced an image like this, where bright pixels are close to you and uh, cold pixels are far away. So because the Kinect had a depth camera, the problem is, of course, much easier than it was when we were trying to analyze RGB images. But it will turn out later that, in fact, it's much easier than general RGB. It's not actually that much easier than this blue screen scenario or this background subtraction scenario that we had here. So it, people sometimes think, say, does Connect work because of the depth camera? The depth camera is crucial, but it's not the only thing that makes Connect work. And this, the work that we did works better in RGB as well as in depth. Um, OK, so they had depth camera, and we still said, yeah, but you know, it's not going to make the problem that much easier. Um, you know, and then they said, well, you know, we've, we've sort of like knocked something together. So these are the programmers in Xbox um, who are not, you know, um, computer vision um, academics. They're just people who look at their data and try to solve problems. And they have built a prototype, which I shall play for you in a second. And the way this prototype works is uh, this box model is representing the current estimate of the body pose. And to start the system, there's the chap. You can see the 3D data of the chap um, here. You enter into the pose, and once you're close enough, the system will lock on and duplicate your motion. OK, so this system in 2008 was, I think, because of the generality of the motion it could handle, was better than anything we had seen in academia in the previous 40 years. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the previous 40 years, just to give you a picture of the approaches we were using. Um, but it had some problems that I'll tell you about later. Um, the main problem that you have to think about is that you have to go into this pose in order to initialize tracking, and that's going to, be, that's going to turn out to be crucial. OK, <clears throat> so Xbox chaps have just basically blown all the work that we had been doing in academia out of the water by having a general purpose, very fast tracker. OK, they had 3D data, but they'd still done an amazing job. Nevertheless, it was useful for us to look into the academic literature to find out ways in which we could make it better. So to give you a very, very um, high-level overview of the literature, um, uh, people had been doing body tracking since uh, a long time ago, since the 80s. Um, and we might have two machine learning people will understand two distinct ways of, um, of tracking. You can use a generative or model-based approach where effectively you have a 
computer graphics model, like these boxes here, which you try to fit to the image. Or you can use a discriminative regression type model where you treat the problem as an abstract regression problem um, and just sort of learn a function that maps from input images to output pose. You can use a tracking-based approach, such as the Xbox folks. So the Xbox post was definitely a model-based approach. It was based on making a 3D model fit the data. That's an excellent approach um, for high accuracy. Um, you can also detect or track. Detect means you treat each image completely independently and try and figure out what the body shape is in that image. Tracking means you use information from the previous frame. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk quite a bit about which of those is better. And you can use a model that recognizes the whole pose at once or divides the image into parts. And again, I'm going to talk about why each is better. But first, let me take you to uh, who knows this paper? One, good, two, good. Okay, so this is, I think, e it's fairly easy to call this the first computer vision paper. And I remind you of it, especially if you're not in computer vision, um, um, or even more so if you are, because what does this paper do? It takes a single two-dimensional image it detects geometric structures, uh, lines in this image, and then it forms a three-dimensional internal representation, and it proves to you that it has a three-dimensional representation by rendering the image from a slightly different viewpoint. So the input image is here, and we're rendering a novel view. And in a sense, this mode of proof is the same as I did by putting mustaches um, on the actor. Uh, I'm demonstrating that something 3D must have happened. Of course, in 1965, there were no um, scanners um, there were no computer graphics, there was no hidden line removal, so all of these things had to be invented by Roberts in order to do the task that we still you know, do a lot in computer vision today. Why am I reminding you of it? Because he, is, uh, again, has a very model-based approach. He's building a model that fits the data. Um, human body tracking starts in about 1980 um, with very synthetic data. Uh, this image that I showed you an example of earlier in 1982 or 83, um, David Hogg from Leeds, is tracking short video sequences, takes a long time, very model-based approach. Uh, by 96, we're tracking very complex scenes with two people interacting, um, but this is with multiple cameras. So we have cameras mounted around the room. We've got very solid, uh, much better 3D than you would get with Kinect from multiple cameras. And um, Gavrila, at this point, introduces or uses for body tracking a representation which looks something like the Turin Shroud, um, a distance transform representation which has been um, uh, very, which was very successful thereafter. In all of this work, we have this sort of idea, you take a computer graphics model and you fiddle with its parameters until it matches the image, okay? If you have 10 to the 13 milliseconds available or microseconds available, this is absolutely the best strategy to take, right? You try every, so you generate every possible range data, range image, and the one that matches the data is definitely you, it's going to be very hard to do better than that as a fitting strategy. The only problem is 10 to the 13, which is our very rough estimate of how many different uh, poses you would need to match the body, is a very big number. Even if you, you know, do um, 10 to the 9 operations per second, it's still a very big number. How do you not spend... Well, obviously, you don't search the whole space, you say. I start from some T pose like this. I know that in the next frame, I can't have moved very far. So maybe I can reduce my search space, and I don't have to search 10 to the 13 poses. I search some smaller number. And maybe I can be clever using gradient descent or something to reduce the number of poses I'm going to search. Uh, this temporal coherence, assuming you were right in the previous frame and then reducing your search space to work well in the next one, was very much an important part of tracking for, for quite a long time. Is it obvious that it's doomed to failure? Right? It's doomed to failure because, assume you have an algorithm which is much, much better than any existing computer vision algorithm, so it's 99.9% .9 accurate. Every frame, if you were right in the previous frame, it'll give you the right answer with 99.9% accuracy. The problem with that algorithm is, let's assume that these failures are independent, but the, the, the math won't go wrong. Um, after, if you're working at 30 frames a second, and the, the power of compound interest is improving your um, probability of error extremely fast, after one minute, you're almost certain to have failed. You're almost certain that one of the frames will have failed you. So after a minute, you're going to have to go back into this T pose and restart the system. And that's not going to be acceptable. Or the amount of the type of games you could write that have that constraint are going to be quite limited. 
Um, you might say, oh, well, you know, we'll just, we've got range data, we've got a model, we'll make the um, per frame failure rate much better. So we'll go to a completely implausible level of accuracy per frame, uh, four nines accuracy. So after a minute, you've still got 20% 20 20 of your customers sending their console back. Um, you know, um, after five minutes, most of them are sending their console back. So it's not going to work. You can't use temporal coherence to make the system, you can't use temporal coherence if you want your system to run for a long time. Don't worry, it'll come back. Temporal, it would be stupid to throw it away. My point is you can't depend on the previous frame being right if you want this frame to be right. Okay, so we need a method which works on a single frame. And um, you know, about 10 years ago, people started to, a number of things I will tell you about were very single frame based. All the single frame methods we knew about were based on machine learning, so we're gonna be doing some machine learning. And because we're gonna be doing some machine learning, we'll need some training data. And in fact, because we really want this thing to work rather than just you know, have a figure in a paper, we're gonna need lots of training data. And if you're going to give an answer at a single frame, the answer is going to be ambiguous. So you need to give a probabilistic answer, not a hard answer, um, at least in the intermediate phases. So, what do you do if you want to detect something in a single frame? Well, there's this uh, famous paper from the uh, International Conference of Computer Vision in 2001, which says, given a training set of lots of face examples and a bunch of images I'm not showing you which are not faces, we can learn a set of very simple uh, difference of bar detectors, which will allow us to process a new image and highlight all the faces. So this is a binary 0, 1 output at every pixel saying whether or not there's a face there, effectively. So this is a single shot face detector using uh, a machine learning technique called boosting. And it's, you know, it's probably in every one of your pockets at the moment uh, in your phone. So what was the, what's the key to making your machine learning algorithm work? Well, you need lots of training data. What does training data look like in this case? Well, it's pairs of the form Z, which is my image. Uh, this is the input image. And then theta, which is the set of 3D joint positions that is, that is correct for this image. And if I have about a million of these pairs of image uh, 3D joint positions, so to be precise, connect outputs 20 body positions, X, Y, Z data for 20, each of 20 joints, so it outputs 60 numbers per frame. So what we need are the pairs where we have the 10,000 numbers for the image and the 60 numbers for the, for the pose. And with lots of those pairs, we would hope to build a system which can, um, which can process new images and output the correct pose. So we didn't know how we were going to solve this problem. Um, the Xbox people said that we were going to, but we didn't know how. So the only thing we could do straight away was say that we needed lots of training data. The first thing they did was they visited 10 homes across the planet. So they just sort of randomly picked 10 living rooms and sent out a prototype camera with, with no games on it and told the people in those living rooms to dance around as if they were playing this as yet uninvented game system. So they visited real places to find out what the data would look like in a real world application. We also knew that we could get examples of typical body poses. We want lots of examples of these 60 element vectors. Um, those of you who've watched the extras of any modern DVD will know that you stick silver markers on a person, you view them with multiple cameras, uh, and then you can get, a, it's a very uh, easy way to get three dimensional information about the movement of a person. So this process of motion capture gives us examples of human poses. Of course, we don't have range images for this person. And then we're going to have to make it work for a lot of different body sizes and body shapes. We don't want the thing, one of the problems with the early prototypes was they tended to work on pale, skinny computer scientists, um, which was not the, which was exactly not the target market of Connect. Um, okay. so. Mocap gives us joint positions, and from joint positions, I can just use computer graphics to generate me synthetic depth images. So if I've got a lot of, lots of body joint data, I can just generate depth images. This is the great advantage of range data in this machine learning context. It's much easier to generate um, realistic depth images than it is realistic images with clothing, with all the possible colors of clothing. So that's how we're going to get one piece of data. Um, when we started, we didn't have a good graphics pipeline uh, we found this tool, Motion Builder, which people use in the games industry to generate 3D images from, uh, from pose data. Uh, and we knew we needed a range of body types, 
but this is the standard range of body types you get with Motion Builder. So we're slightly broadening our demographic, um, but I'm not sure it's yet mainstream. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the final thing you have to do when making this range data is this is the output of computer graphics. If you fed this to the learning algorithm, it would detect the head by finding noses because this has a lovely high-res nose. The nose looks completely different to anything else on the body. Machine learning would home in and build you a fantastic nose detector. And then when you use it on real data, you would find out that the real Kinect doesn't have such clean data on noses. So uh, you take your computer graphic output and then you artificially um, fix the depth resolution and the noise to match the sensor. Uh, you randomly give people black hair. Uh, black hair will sometimes cause dropouts in the sensor. Um, and then sometimes, not illustrated here, you just randomly chop off pieces of the data because that sometimes happens um, if people go too close to the sensor or if they go out the left-hand side. Okay, so I've told you that because I want you to have a picture of the kind of training data we have. We still haven't, I still haven't told you anything about how we're going to solve the, the pose problem. So we have an image. We're going to do some processing to this image, so I'm going to call it a vector Z of some parameters. You know, um, if you're not in computer vision, you can imagine just measuring heights, areas, um, running an edge detector and measuring the number of edges. This sort of, you can imagine representing the image as some vector of, of features. And we want to learn some function f. We want to build the code for a function f which takes an image Z and spits out 60 numbers, the joint angles theta. And if you're not in machine learning, you can just think of machine learning as find me a function F, which matches, which, which works well on my training data. One way of doing that, also at ICCB 2001, there was a beginning of an approach, uh, or a paper which represents something like the beginning of an approach, where we're going to take an image, convert it to edges, and then we're going to use a very simple classifier to, um, to map a new video onto, onto our database. This paper was good because it shows you how to do this probabilistically. We'll talk about something much simpler to begin with. So what's my machine learning algorithm going to do? Here's my training data. Um, somehow that training data is fed in to produce my magic function. And when I get a new image, I'm going to push it through the function, and hopefully it's going to give me the pose. If you are doing machine learning, always try nearest neighbor first. What does nearest neighbor do? Take my input image and compare it, and you might be more or less clever in how you compare it, to each of the examples in the database, find the closest example, spit out the corresponding pose from the training data, and that's your answer. Okay, it's not gonna be right, the correct pose for this image is something like that. But this pose will be close enough that a tracking-based process can pretend that this is the previous frame, this is the new frame, and we can use the tracking-based algorithm to to, to get to the right pose. So this is always, you must always try this first. So we tried this first. Um, here is a very uh, early prototype video where we're mapping only the uh, right arm. The white is the input data, and the red image is showing you the nearest pose from the database. Works great on his right arm. It's not doing anything with his left arm because our database contains only motion from the, from the whichever arm it is, the moving one. Um, so you might say, what a dumb algorithm, why are we even trying it? Well, um, it often works very well, and it was the only one known at the time to give you real-time performance. So um, let's have a look at the accuracy. We have some scale up here. We would like to get to <coughs> one, ideally. Current connect is at about 0.75, which is good enough. Um, um, but in those days, we found that um, as we increased the number of training images, we could get up to about 0.1. Okay, so it wasn't really going to get us. We didn't know how high up here we needed to be, but we knew we needed to be you know, well above 0.6. Um, in retrospect, we can extend that line now that we've got lots more training data. So we've got lots and lots of training data, and indeed that line carries on linearly. Um, so today you could get an accuracy of 0.2 using a nearest neighbor algorithm, um, but it's going to take you 500 milliseconds per frame, and it's storing about a gigabyte of data here. Okay. I'm not going to tell you, yeah, because um, it's, you know, it's, it's some made-up number. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, number of joints within a certain correct distance or whatever, um, yeah. But one is good, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this method would work, right? Um, this 
assuming this curve extrapolates, which it probably will, um, and assuming you have a log n search process, which you probably do, therefore, to get this up to one, you only need to increase this time to about seven seconds. Um, the problem is that your training images, because you're storing all the training images, uh, is going to be about 100 terabytes. So uh, the Xbox has half a gigabyte, so that wasn't going to fit. Um, but it was good that we tried it. OK, we were also doing that to buy ourselves some time, because we didn't know what we were going to do. There's a very easy way to make nearest neighbor work much better. Um, instead of doing the body as a whole, which clearly gives you a combinatoric explosion, every left arm position correlated with every right arm position must be represented in the training data, divide the body into some parts. So let's suppose the whole body was 10 to the 12 poses. You might imagine if the parts were completely independent, that each part might correspond to 10 to the 3 poses. They're not going to be independent. So, but you might, you're going to reduce the, um, the complexity of each part. You could detect each part independently and then glue them together later. And that's fine. Um, you've got some problems. The parts aren't independent. And it turns out that knowing where the right hand is is a very good way of, of knowing where the left hand is. Because where the right hand is is where the left hand isn't. So once you break the body up, <laughs> it sounds simple, but you know. So once you break the body up, you start increasing your ambiguity. So there's that problem, but it does get better. So we were playing around with this idea, and then Jamie, who had been looking at how to recognize cows and sheep and so on, thought, well, if you're going to divide it into four parts, surely it must be good to divide it into 32 parts. Um, why 32? Because you know it's 2 to the 5. Um, um, so uh, Jamie's idea was, I'm going to pretend that this is a sheep, and this is building, and this is road. Uh, I'm going to arbitrarily mark parts of the body and say that they are different categories, um, such as we used in the object recognition. And my machine learning algorithm is going to take the input image and then just output uh, assigned to each pixel a label saying what part of the body it is. And that's sort of the key idea, that um, we already have a fast object recognition strategy. Let's turn this into an object recognition problem. The first thing we're going to have to do is get more training data. This was the old training data where we had pairs of image and pose. Now we're going to um, have pairs of image and what we call the Harlequin image, or the image where every pixel is labeled by with its body part. Again, easy to do this in computer graphics. You just sort of texture map. You give the person a texture map suit with the appropriate colors. Um, so it's great that we're using computer graphics. Um, and yeah, and now we're going to use these examples to learn our pose. Um, we're doing better than the motion builder body types. So now we have a wider range of body types um, you know, of shapes and sizes. Um, we push the various combinations of poses, body types, uh, the position that the camera might be in, the tilt of the camera, any other stuff we thought of, um, push them in through computer graphics, and then generate ourselves a million image pairs. And then you, we can view the training data. So these are all the uh, pictures of the training samples that our algorithm is going to learn from. I'm showing only the output here. You can imagine the inputs, the range data inputs. So as you notice, all the uh, fat people have been put in here. Um, and then all the thin people do this. <laughs> so this is a picture of a million different images of, of, of people. We're not going to um, store all of those million images in the computer. We're going to find some way to greatly compress this data in order to solve our problem. Um, that's a good question. Um, it, it turns out that the training gets hard. Um, and I don't know if I'm covering that. I think I'm not. Um, no one had ever really been able to train on this level. So one of the patents we have is on how you make decision tree training um, work on a million, uh, you know, on this huge data sets. Um, Okay, so here's the first picture I'm going to show you of the system beginning to run. Okay, so here's an input image, and here's the output. Uh, orange is right hand, blue is left hand. You can see that it has automatically labeled the pixels, not as good as the ground truth, obviously, but it's got some idea of what the left and right hands are. Uh, it's done it right here. And more importantly, it's doing it right over here, where the left and right hand are both on the, right, on the same side of the body. So the system can tell you and we'll see in a minute, is really looking almost completely independently at every pixel. The system can tell you uh, where the head is and where the left and right hands are. 
and I hope you believe that, and I'll tell you a little bit how it works, um, given this information, we can get good tracking of the body. Okay, so how does it do it? We take every pixel independently, and I'm gonna focus on this pixel in a minute. We look in some uh, window of the data around that pixel, and we learn a mapping, a probabilistic mapping from that pixel to which body part is underneath it. So that pixel is uh, hand, it's orange. This pixel is leg, it's colored blue. I said we were going to do it probabilistically. What, what do I mean? When I'm analyzing this pixel, the kind of answer I want to output is not right hand, but a probability distribution that says it's right hand with this probability. It could also be left hand, right and left hands do look very similar. Um, it's definitely not a shoulder, um, but there's some possibility of it being a chest or an, and a head. So the output at every pixel is a list of 31 probabilities, not the label of the, the object that's under that pixel. And we're going to learn this, these probabilities from the training data. But before I tell you how we learn them, let me just tell you what exactly happens at runtime um, in this part of Connect. We want it to run fast. And yeah, we want it to be accurate. Uh, a good way to get stuff that runs fast is to take stuff that ran fast in the 60s and run it today, because that's normally pretty fast today. Um, a technology that was fast in the 60s is a decision tree. And the way the decision tree works is, at a root node, you perform some very simple test on our data. So I'm going to look at this pixel, and I'm going to say, uh, to the northwest, by a certain amount, what is the difference in depth between this pixel and the pixel to the northwest? That's the incredibly simple test that's going to be used at the root of the tree. So let's look at this pixel. That distance is certainly greater than 60 millimeters. So we're down in the yes part of the tree. And if I looked back at my training data and looked at all the images that answered yes, or all the pixels that answered yes um, at this root node of the tree, I would find that at the start, the probability is effectively uniform. I, don't, I have no idea what is under this pixel because I haven't even looked at it yet. After a single test saying yes, I have a slightly refined probability of what's going on under there. Not much has happened except it's probably not chest because most chest pixels don't have a big jump um, you know, that distance away. So I've slightly refined my estimate of what's happening here. And now I apply another test. So now I'm looking at this uh, southeast pixel Maybe this time the answer is no. And as I go through the tree, this probability distribution gets more and more refined. The actual trees are uh, depth. Um, well, we've experimented with up to 20. So this picture is very simplified. Um, but ultimately, the idea is the same. You get these refined probability distributions. And then when I draw the pictures, I'm just picking the most probable one and coloring the pixel with that. But it's important to remember that downstream, we have access to all these probabilities. Um, let's just see the tree again. Here's another pixel, also part of the hand. In this case, the first test fails, so we're in the no side. A new, different test is applied because we failed the first one. And again, we get a refined probability. And in this completely different leaf node of the tree, again, it turns out the right hand is the most probable explanation. So that's, a, that's, that's how the decision tree works. There's just a description of the whole tree. And it's important to think that this tree is constant. Yeah, so I think, um, so, so one answer is you, you have to look in the tree, and I'll search for a hidden slide in a minute that will show us, show us the, uh, the inside of the tree. Um, but loosely speaking, if, um, if you have enough training examples, I mean, you know, very coarsely speaking, if you have enough training examples where all the weird stuff happens, it learns that um, if the right hand is over here, there's gotta be lots of, lots of chesty stuff you know, to its left. If the right hand's over here, there's gonna be a lot of background. And, and so you've got, simply got to ask yourself, given a window of this size, could I decide if that was right hand or left? The, the window's big enough that it can still see the chest if the hand's over here. Probably, you know, the window's probably about this size. Um, yeah, exactly, tiny window. Um, makes good use of training data, but is not very accurate. Big window requires more training data 
because there are more different, there's more context. So. Doing what, sorry? From biomolecules, yeah, right. Right, yeah. I mean, decision trees, you know, a pretty well-known um, strategy. The, the, in a sense, the clever bit here is deciding to use them. Um, okay, uh, one important thing about decision trees. Decision trees, if you train a single tree, it can end up um, highly overconfident about the wrong answer. There are lots of uh, ways you can stop decision trees getting overconfident about the wrong answer. A very good one is to simply, uh, when you're training your tree, do random, uh, your tree, tree training is essentially a random process. You can't search over the space of all trees. So you simply take a few random uh, decision trees. So if we, have, if we mix the output of two different decision trees, this pixel in tree one goes down this path with this probability distribution. In the teeth tree, it goes down this other path and simply adding these probability distributions together, it turns out solves overfitting. Um, so that's a useful tip. Okay, um, how much does it solve overfitting? Well, quite a bit. This accuracy number may or may not be the same as the one I showed you earlier, it doesn't matter. The point is that um, for a single tree, we get an accuracy of this arbitrary number, and um, as we increase the number of decision trees, our accuracy goes up. After a while, more trees doesn't help very much. We can view that with numbers here on the left, or we can view it um, qualitatively on the right. This is the output of a single tree. It's coarsely got the hands right, but as you can see, there's a lot of noise. As we move to a greater number of trees, we get um, more visually appealing output, and the numbers are higher. Related to your question is, what does the thing actually do? What's it actually learning? Well, we can do something very simple. We can say, suppose I simply label every pixel by whether it went yes or no at the very top of the tree. It turns out this is the label. The pixels down here all say no, and the pixels up here all say yes. So you can, you can from this, immediately guess what the first test is. Upside down person? Okay, so watch this person's head. I think it will be, I, let's see at the end uh, if this answers, I think it will, right? So, um, so the top node is obviously just looking you know, north a bit and saying, is there anything blank there? So it gives you this decision of top and bottom half of the, of the image. You can then see that both of the second level nodes um, do something about dividing the body into left and right halves. <clears throat> Nothing special happening here. As we increase the depth of the tree, we're beginning to get towards um, decent part labelings. It's finally, and you might think after depth 10, it's finally learned that the top of the body is the head. You know, couldn't it have learned that incredibly simply by just saying the topmost pixel is the head? Well, the answer is you might be doing yoga. So um, the topmost pixel isn't the head. Okay, so at depth 10, it's learned kind of the dumb stuff that you could have just hacked together anyway. Okay. It still hasn't learned what the hands are, but it's getting, a, getting towards the ground truth. As we increase the depth of the tree, it's beginning to learn that this isn't a head. It doesn't look right for a head, okay? But this data here, and of course it's getting hands right up here and so on. As we move right down to depth, eight, depth 18, you can see that the easy case up here is now handled pretty well. And the hard case has stopped labeling the false head here and is starting to give us head labels down in the right area. So, because the training data contains these yoga poses, it's not quite a yoga pose, but you know, close, um, uh, we, 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 we generalize. Um, so should I just increase the depth of the tree forever? Well, it turns out not. As a, if, if you imagine, I've only got 15,000 tra training images, and let's imagine that each of those, that gives a, let's imagine that just gives us a million training pixels in total. Then, if I have only a million training pixels, then two to the 20 leaf nodes is going to give me one pixel in every leaf node, right? The decision tree is going to simply remember every single pixel in the training data and say what the, what the classification was for that. So when you apply it to new data, your performance is gonna start going down. So with too little training data, 
uh, tree, de tree depth begins to hurt you after a certain depth. Um, when you increase the amount of training data, we can see that our performance is increasing um, even, you know, even up to the maximum tree that we like to hold in memory. So. Right. So that's kind of it, right? We've taken the data, colored the image according to body parts. I'm now showing you a, a blurry um, image where we're weighting the body parts effectively by confidence. And from that confidence map, we can build some hypotheses as to where uh, the hand joints are, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to tell you about that algorithm. It's fairly straightforward. Let's have a look at how the thing works when you apply that. So here's a video of an input range image. Here's the output of this um, coloring process. So again, you're looking at the hands and checking how often they're right, or the head if you like. OK, so this video is fairly straightforward. They're mostly fine. And then you can look at the, down here, we're looking at three different views of the three-dimensional um, estimates of where the joints are. So again, if you look at the orange blob, you'll see how the system is tracking the right hand. Very importantly, this is the output with absolutely no dependence on the previous frame. This is absolutely take each frame anew and just output the most likely uh, joint position. Um, you can make the thing a little harder by adding two people in. The system is working completely independently per pixel. So when the people are well separated, it doesn't care at all. And you'll notice that even when the people are quite close, once they come out of occlusion, obviously when they're in occlusion, when one is occluded by the other, you know, well, obviously we're getting nothing for the person behind. But even when they're relatively close together, we're still getting a reasonably clean delineation. Here's a good case where left and right hand are confused, but I'm only showing you the most likely output here. It's very likely that a blue pixel is just slightly lower probability. We maintain that, therefore, we don't lose track. Um, back to our famous accuracy figure. Well, you know, that's what we thought we could have got with nearest neighbor. This is what we get with the decision tree. Uh, it's 100 times faster, and it's given us an accuracy that we now know is sufficient to play games with. Um, I told you that um, I told you that I wasn't going to throw away the temporal information. I don't think I'm going to tell you how, um, but just to tell you, we don't. Those joint positions they look good to us um, when you actually need to report a skeleton position to the user of Connect. It's important that you don't report that this arm is twice the length of this arm, which this system currently, as I've described it to you, has absolutely no idea. So. There is going to be great disambiguation of left and right hand once you insist that the left hand is connected to the left elbow, et cetera. So there's a, a whole process that we didn't do at Cambridge, um, fitting a skeleton to this exemplar output. And that process also says, well, I've done everything I can in a single frame. The system says, I'm either um, in this pose or in this pose. Well, then report the one that was closest to where you were previously. That's fine. That's OK, all right? Um, that's OK, providing in the next frame you throw away um, enough of that information. I can talk about it later. Um, so that's the story of how you get the skeletons. And then there's the thing that happens when the games designers get hold of this. So they, and I don't know if you've seen you know, the range of games for Connect. But I think it's amazing the way that they have broken away from traditional uh, computer games. Some of them look like tra traditional computer games, but a lot of them are quite new ways of interacting. And I'm really hoping that um, in the future, you know, this is absolutely the beginning of a new way of interacting with computers. And as, you can, as you've probably already seen, uh, games are just, just the edge of the iceberg. Um, incredible imagination of games designers and of you is what we want to depend on. <laughs> Thank you. Well, do you know that we've just released the SDK, right? So 
And in fact, that SDK, we've released the skeleton tracking as well. So um, we are very interested to see what people do with a skeleton tracker, you know, um, and yeah, I think, I think releasing the SDK means Microsoft likes people to, to think of new applications. Okay, thank you.